So wonderful to see all these people in real life. It's the first time we've been together for this event since 2019, which was our first annual. So we're on our fourth annual here. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, sort of part two, part one was virtual, part two is in person. Um, I want to dive right into this afternoon programming because we are in for such a treat with a conversation we are about to have. But I just wanted to note something that Melissa said this morning for those of you who were listening, and I was struck by it. You know, when she said she's the English teacher and she had to look up the word umbrella. And the second definition was a protecting force or influence, which is exactly what an umbrella is. And it, that's exactly what umbrella is. So for those of you on the umbrella advisory board who are in this room, I'd really like you to stand because these are the women who are the protecting force or influence. So if you'd stand, those of you who are in the room. Thank you. Thanks to all of them for the great work that, that they do year in and year out for uh, the women of UMB. So I am thrilled to welcome Tamika Tramalio back to UMB. Yes, back. It's been a minute, but she is a 1995 graduate of our Carey School of Law, which wasn't the Carey School of Law back then. It's just the plain old University of Maryland School of Law. She's a Maryland girl through and through. She is from Southern Maryland. She went to get her bachelor's degree at Mount St. Mary's University, her law degree right here at UMB, and her MBA at the University of Baltimore. After spending 26 years in the consulting world, she left Deloitte in 2022 to become executive director of the National Basketball Players Association and she channels her legal and financial experience into negotiating for NBA players. I, I don't even know what that is like, so <laughs> hopefully we're gonna find out. And she's there to guide an organization that's known for its work in the social justice arena. Her bio is in your program, please read it. I just wanna dive right in and start talking and let Tamika tell us her story for herself. Tamika? <clears throat> Wow, there's a lot of people in here. Great. Well, thanks for being here. Can you tell us the title of a book, song, or movie that most represents your life, your path, your career? Well, I can't use Girl of Ames, right, because that's your book. Um, but I, I know that Toni Morrison said if, you know, there isn't a book that describes your story that maybe you need to write one. So I, I think to myself, perhaps at some point in time, I will write one. But I have had the pleasure, of course, of reading such amazing books. I'm a big self-help book reader. And one of them in particular is The Empress Has No Clothes. You all might have heard of that. But it's The Imposter Syndrome. And it was written by a woman called, named Joyce Roche, who has become a mentor of mine. And, you know, it, while I, I wouldn't say it is my story now, but it is certainly one of those steps, I think, throughout my career. And so that would certainly be one of them. And then this morning I heard on the radio who runs the world. And I was like, that might be the song. <laughs> they both work for me. Thank you. Um, I'm going to skip around a little bit because you just did mention imposter syndrome. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, we don't know much about you yet other than what we read in the um, bio, but I would like to know how imposter syndrome has impacted your rise to where you are right now? So I, I would say, first of all, I don't think I knew that there was a such thing, right? I didn't know how to articulate what that was. And typically, imposter syndrome is 
when you feel less than or less valued or that there's somehow people are going to figure you out. And to some extent, what you find is that people who suffer from the imposter syndrome are overworking, overtired, overcompensating, doing more than most people because you keep feeling like and there's going to be this moment when they realize like you don't belong or you shouldn't be there. And in fact, the truth is I thought it was something that primarily women and even maybe women of color experience, but the reality is everyone experience it at some point in their lives. For us, we experience it more because it happens when you find yourself the only one in the room or there isn't a whole lot of people that look like you or saying the same things that you say. But men feel that way too. And I remember in Joyce's book, she talks about the CEO of AT&T, Eric Whitaker, and how he had felt like an imposter when he became CEO. And in particular, he had been asked to go to Aspen and to go skiing with a CEO from another Fortune 100 company and their family. And he was like, God, I've never skied. He really didn't ski because it was a, it's really expensive to ski. And he didn't grow up with the means to be able to ski. And he grew up where there wasn't you know, huge mountains, so you'd have to travel, you know, all the things that come with that. And so he had his family getting lessons. He had all new equipment. He bought the best clothes. They were pulling their tags off like when they got to the little lodge. And he said, because he wanted them to fit in. And so when that happens, though, it brings about not the best behavior either in some instances, right? I mean, it causes anxiety. There are all kinds of things um, that happen when you suffer from the imposter syndrome. But it also makes you an overachiever. So there's some positive aspects of that, too. But you do have to recognize it, because at some point, you can't do all of these other things. You can't keep overcompensating, particularly when you're finding that others aren't doing that as well, right? And so I think it, it had been a journey for me, particularly when I found myself as the first or the only in situations. So at what point in your life did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up? Do you know what you want to be when you grow up? No, actually, I think it was five um, was when I started telling my dad that I wanted to negotiate allowance and all of those things. He was like, oh my gosh, he's totally going to be a lawyer. And he said, your, your brother is so kind. He's going to be a minister. <laughs> Go figure. My, my husband, my husband, my brother, was just um, inducted two weeks ago as a minister, so I'm incredibly proud of him. <laughs> And here I am. But the truth is, I think I also loved numbers and I loved problem solving. And so, you know, coming here to University of Maryland School of Law, one of the great things about it is that it has always been innovative in terms of, you know, where you find your passion, where you can be your authentic self. And so while we had a JD MBA program, it was really important for them to make sure that I was getting to do, you know, all of the students to do the things that they were really passionate about. And you couldn't do a class here at University of Maryland at 10 and a business class at 1130, right? It just wouldn't work out. And I remember just going to ask the dean, do you think I could possibly do it with University of Baltimore? It was very new because people who went to law school went to law school to avoid the numbers and avoid blood. And what happened was you, when I got there, I was like, you know what, I really, I never missed the blood for those of you who are in medical school or involved with medical school, but I definitely missed the numbers. And he said, you know, I don't see why not. No one's ever done it, but why not try it? Why not consider it? And so here I am, um, having had the experience and the exposure to both. What do you think? What could you tell us that you gained from your experience here at Cary Law? What is that tangible benefit of coming to our law school? Yeah. So first of all, it was an incredible gift, right? It was, you know, when you think or dream about doing, you know, going to law school at the age of five years old. I grew up in St. Mary's County, so a very small tobacco town. Anybody from St. Mary's County in here? It's like, for once, I can actually ask. Yes, yeah, I'm very proud of it, too. Thank you very much. So it's funny, I would never ask that in most situations, but I'm like, I'm not that far. Um, but it, you know, there's not much that you're exposed to, right? And so all you see that was successful was either a doctor or a lawyer. And you know, my mother was working as a parole and probation officer, and she would always say to me, like, "Oh, that's such and such," and you know, he does this or he defended this person, or you know, look at the car they drive, the house, you know, whatever it was. All of those things, you know, that obviously we learn later in life don't matter. But that was all that I knew. And so coming here 
and getting exposed to sort of a very different world. I think one, obviously, the ability to be innovative, right? Because the law school taught me that I could take risk, I could ask the questions. And then two, I think one of the things that I often say to women that is not original, but Carla Harris had discovered this was sort of this pie. And I'm going to share this with you in hopes that you'll share this with other women as well. But typically, women are so focused on performance. And so she describes what she classifies as a pie. So performance, image, exposure. And she said that you know, as a woman or as a minority, the only thing we know is that if you continue to get A's, if you continue to you know, get the highest score in something, then you're going to be successful. So when we get into our jobs, when we get into the things that we're doing, we put our head down and we focus on performing. So, and we spend 90% of our time on that. And then you have this only 10% of your time that you can use on image and exposure. And coming to Maryland, I learned that, it yes, it's about the performance, because that's sort of baseline. It's the cost of admission. But first of all, let's be very clear that most of us are not going to get in any position that we're in because we are not performing, right? So that's the baseline. So then you got to think about where else you can do things. Where are you going to stretch yourself? Where are you going to do things that are unique? It's going to be an image and exposure. She said the reality is, particularly when you get in the workforce, you should be focused on image and exposure. So you should flip it around totally, because none of us are going to fail. None of us are going to just show up as we see others do, right? So we are already going to perform or have performed to get to where we are. Where we're going to fail is on the things that are most important, which is on your image and exposure. And image is not how you look. It is how you carry yourself, how you show up. It's the confidence that you exude, right? And then your exposure, just getting exposure, being here today, hearing a different story. Those things are really important and oftentimes, we will sit in our office, we will keep our head down, we will focus on the end goal because we think that that's what's going to get us to the next level. And the reality is it's not. So when you look at your pie, you know, and I am a math person, instead of being 90 and 10, it should be more like 10, 15, and you should be spending 30% of your time on image and 60% on exposure getting exposed to other things as well. Now, as you get more senior in your career, so let's say at law school, I was probably 90, 10, right? But once you learn your craft, you start to dial it back and spend the time focused on the other things. So what's your percentage now in your current role? Wow, that's a great question. Right now, because this is a year, 13 months in, I'm on performing. <laughs> and I'm in the middle of CBA negotiations, right? And so it is about performing. They aren't paying me for image and exposure, right? <laughs> um, they've got all that down. So I really am focused on how am I going to perform? How am I going to come out at the end of the day? That's what is important to our players. That's what I have to make sure that I do well. And in spite of that, I, I was sharing with Shara earlier earlier that it was so important for me to be here. Inky, who's my chief of staff, will tell you we like canceled most of the things this month because we have a pretty big deadline and we're talking about billions of dollars. But I felt like this was so important. One, it's International Women's Day, so thank you for having me on a day like today. But two, because being amongst women is like chicken soup for my soul, right? It is like that's where I get my energy. That's where I feel like I can just do a little bit more. And when it's late at night or when, you know, you're getting yelled at from inside and outside, that you're like, okay, but I have my, you know, my group that I can sort of like rely on. So it was really important to me to make sure I was doing that. Thank you. This might be a good time. What is a CBA negotiation? What yes. Every day? Yes. Who knows? Every day is different. <laughs> um, but CBA is a collective bargaining agreement. And you know, luck would have it that it would be time for a new one in the sixth year. And so here I am coming into a CBA negotiation. This is really where we are determining everything from how our players are paid, how you know, often they are tested, whether there's load management. I mean, every issue that you could possibly think about is in the CBA. I mean, hundreds of pages, things that you wouldn't even consider, like whether you register your car, whether, I mean, it is outrageous. And so we are spending, we've spent the last year really in the weeds, focused on 
all of those details. Now, at the end of the day, there are things that are you know big ticket items that we have to spend more time on, but really it is doing that on a day-to-day -day basis. I also am here to protect our players, which you know may happen occasionally. I'm here to support them, and I'm here, here to amplify them, to tell people how wonderful they are. This has been the greatest and most rewarding gift is to serve in this role with 450 of the most talented men in the world who are also incredibly compassionate and empathetic. They give back so much. And people don't know about them. I often say to them, what's your aunt? Because the reality is, if you know, you know, like Chris Paul or Seth Curry or LeBron James or CJ McCollum, you know them as the basketball player. But C.J. McCollum owns a vineyard. He has a big business. His wife is a dentist. He had his first son. That's their aunt. And when I think about our children and even my boys who play 2K, for example, I think about I want them to know all of the things that these men are doing to contribute to society because it's very unlikely, just given the percentage of people who make it to the NBA, that the majority of children who actually see them will get there. So I want them to know all of the other ways that they can contribute to society, and they are doing that. It's just a matter of whether or not that's being shown. So I, I'm spending time focused on that as well. Is there any advantage to be a woman in a man's world, like hmm. working and negotiating? Well, because you're recording. NBA <laughs> so, um, you know what, I, I would say not. I, I would say there's no advantage or disadvantage, quite frankly. I am certain that we think about or approach things differently. Um, but I think the reality is, you know, we are all, all of the individuals and in our union is a little over 100 professionals that, you know, are serving them on a daily basis. And I don't think, you know, being a male or female brings, you know, anything special per se, what I do think matters is that there is diversity, right? I think that we are all better off because we have women and we have men and that we have, you know, people of different backgrounds, et cetera. That's really what makes us who we are. It also is what helps us to be able to support our players in a way that's appropriate, particularly since the fans are all diverse, right? And so we have to be able to appreciate that everyone's going to look at things or come at things differently. So I think that's probably the advantage. So the Umbrella Group's theme for this academic year and this symposium is innovative leadership. How do you define an innovative leader? And how does innovation relate to your own journey? So, you know, I, I think by definition, I think it means sort of thinking outside of the box. And so one of the things that I did when I first came to the MDPA was I had this theme of reimagine the possible. So everything you see when you would come to my office, the basketballs, everything, say reimagine the possible. And the reason that I did that is because I wanted people to get out of their thinking of how things have been, but rather focus on what could be. So if you can imagine a union that has been around for 70 plus years in some form or another, right? Everybody's been very used to doing things a certain way. Well, in 2017, we won our group licensing rights back. So we are no longer just a union, right, that is there to protect, support, and amplify the players. We have a commercial arm that we are actually outselling our group licensing. So if you think about the Nikes of the world or 2K or Fanatics, that's group licensing. Anytime you're going to have four more players, that's group licensing. So we are a business, right? Which actually, when you think about it from a business perspective, it also gives us power. Because then we're not as concerned about, oh my gosh, if we get locked out, we're not going to have any money to pay for people to pay for our players to pay for lawyers, et cetera. So it gives you a certain amount of power. But it also means that you got to think about how you go to business, how you do things differently. So if you have an organization that's only focused on serving in a union capacity, isn't thinking on serving in a business capacity, generating more revenue, you've got to think about things differently. So I have said, I want you to reimagine the possible. Before you say no to anything, I want you to imagine 
what it would be like to do that. If we could always end up at no, but I want to know that you've taken certain steps to consider things before you've decided that this is not a possibility. So that's how I have put it into action. Um, and really, if you ask anyone in our office, they will tell you that I put my money where my mouth is. I, I'm willing to try most things. Um, but I also want to know that people are actually considering what they could do outside of the box. Imagining the impossible. The possible. The impossible or the, the possible? possible? The possible. That might be our theme next year. Oh, good. Write that down, someone. <laughs> so when you were at Deloitte, how many years were you at Deloitte? So I was at Deloitte for 11 years. 11 years, OK. Mm -hmm. And they had a storytelling series called Uncensored Black Professionals of Deloitte. Mm -hmm. You wrote a piece in there that I really enjoyed reading. Um, did you read part of what you wrote? And then um, I have a question for you. OK, sure. I definitely will. And, and I will say just my quick background at Deloitte, which was my last years of consulting, it was the largest office in the world. We had over 17,000 professionals. We were the most diverse in the country. I was the first African-American female. So talk about the imposter syndrome, right? And to have these sort of stories was very rare because people didn't talk about these things. And so being more authentic and transparent was really key. So it starts, huh, imagine that by, I must be transparent. It can be incredibly lonely to be a black woman in leadership in corporate America. There aren't nearly enough of us. And I don't think many people can appreciate the pressure and weight that many of us feel on a daily basis, not only as a black leader in our organization, but as black women in America. This is my story. I have and will continue to, tra to travel my journey while creating space for others. To be honest, I was apprehensive to share my story for this series, but if I've been blessed enough to be given a seat at the table, I need to make sure that I am using my voice. Otherwise, as Michelle Obama has said, I need to give up my seat. And I've worked too hard for it to not use it to serve others. What do you do as part of your leadership journey to help others who maybe have been marginalized or underrepresented have that seat at the table and not give it up? Yeah. So, you know, it is tough. First of all, it's about recognizing that you deserve to be there, right? So you have to show up. And you have to show up in all of your glory whatever that is, bringing all of your strengths to the table. It also means that you have to think about the shoulders that you stand on that have gotten you there to make sure that you're bringing other people up. There is an expectation, from my perspective, that you are bringing other people along with you. I contribute my success at Deloitte not by the you know, dollars that were raised or you know, et cetera, but rather how many partners I made, how many people I was able to advance in their career. That's what it means to serve others and not serve yourself quite frankly. And it's hard, right? Because there aren't a whole lot of people that look like you. And I know you all have probably talked about in the past about sponsorship and mentoring. And we're always looking for people that look just like us to mentor or sponsor us. And the reality is there aren't that many. So I felt, particularly at Deloitte, like everyone I wanted to bring along. But instead, I made it other people's jobs to make sure that they were bringing others along as well. And they didn't need to look like them. And so that, to me, was critically important. In basketball world, they call it assist. I, that is exactly what I was making sure was happening each and every day. That's what brings me joy. Tell us about an obstacle to success that you faced and how you overcame it. Now, there have been many, um, as you all can imagine. I, I think, um, obviously, the imposter syndrome was one of them. I, I started my career, actually, right here in Baltimore at KPMG. Um, and I started in our tax practice. And it was really challenging, because when you came out of law school, you know, 25 years ago, almost 30 now, um, with a JD MBA, people had no idea what to do with you. So it was either investment banking or tax. Those were your options. And I didn't want to live in New York, right? That's very funny, because that's 
where I live now. Um, and I was like, I, you know, that's not happening for me. So I'm going to go to the big five, which we considered almost like doing a clerkship, right? You know, and you spend your time, your head's down. It's the right training ground. And so that's what I thought I wanted to do. Nine months in, I was supposed to be doing Section 482 work, so which is like taking money offshore to invest it so that you aren't paying taxes in the US, which is sort of forensic in nature. And we had a forensic practice. Well, who knew there was actually forensic practice that existed, right? This was a fairly new area. And I remember talking to one of the partners, and he said, oh, this would be great. Come over and work with our team. You can help us with some of the experts, et cetera. It's a three-month rotation. And I went to our tax partner in charge, and I said, I would love to do a rotation in that group. And he said, well, you can go try it, but I can't guarantee your job will be here when you get back. And I thought, wow. Now, the reality is, I at that time, I certainly wasn't in a position where I was like, OK, I don't need a job in three months. I have like debt everywhere. I just got out of graduate school. I, I don't need it. But I, my mother, I remember her saying to me, the fruit is always on the limb. And you have to sort of stretch yourself. And you just got to get in there. You've been given this seat at the table, and you've got to deliver. And so the three-month rotation turned into nine years. So I think that's what you have to face is like, what do you have to do to rise to that? And then you've got to figure out what it has come to teach you. And sometimes with the lessons and the experiences that we have, I'm often so surprised that people haven't thought about what the lesson was. It's been a problem, and you know it's a problem, and you focus so much on the problem, but we all come out of those problems. But what happens is we end up back in the same situation because we haven't been taught the lesson. And so I have learned that through all of those obstacles, I have to step back sometimes and say, what have you come to teach me? What am I going to take from this experience instead of giving the experience itself power? And you have to be comfortable with rest. You do. It's hard. It is really hard. You know, I have this acronym for fear. I often ask people, what would you do if you weren't afraid? What would you do if you took fear out of the equation? And I remembered reading something probably on social media somewhere, and it said um, the acronym, because you can see I love acronyms. So it could be um, for fear. It could be forget everything and run, so F-E-A-R, or face everything and rise and you have to choose to rise and so for me that's always been what I think like if I wasn't afraid Tamika would you do this yeah. so we've talked a little bit about negotiating earlier and I bet if we asked the room how many of you are good at negotiating let's go ahead how many of us are good at negotiating Char, I would say you're very good at negotiating. Well, a couple of us have made a living of negotiating. <laughs> All right, so that's like, what, 0.0%? 1%? Why are women either hesitant to negotiate, think we're not good at it? Why is it easy for, say, me to negotiate for my employees, but not for myself? Yeah. What's that barrier that makes us not think we're good at negotiating? Yeah, so... Gratefully, so that's, I should have answered that to your first question of what did I get out of University of Maryland Law School. Well, as Shara will tell you, and maybe any other people that are here from the law school, I am jerk negotiations, which means you got the highest grade in the entire year in negotiation. So somehow, because I lived in a performance world, right, I thought, oh, I'm good at negotiating. But the truth is, we really aren't, right? We can do it exceptionally well on behalf of other people. I mean, all day. I will go up and thank God that's what I'm doing right now, right? Go up and fight on behalf of someone else because it just makes perfect sense, right? The reality is when it comes to ourselves, we bring in all of the baggage with that. Everything we doubted, everything we ever thought we weren't good at, any of those things, they come up. So the truth is to be able to negotiate on behalf of yourself, you need to know your value. And the problem is, is that many of us don't know our value. So actually understanding what that means and giving it some power means you can do that. It also means that you, you need to learn how to listen, too. The reason we're good at negotiating on behalf of other people is we don't have enough that we know about what's happening that we stop listening. When we're negotiating on behalf of ourselves, we're like, I know I deserve this. I know what X, Y, and Z is paid. I know what I should be paid, blah, blah, blah. Because, and then we stop listening. When we're negotiating on other people, we're willing to hear 
why someone would come up with other things. And you have to do the same thing when you're negotiating on your behalf of yourself, too, because we already walk in with assumptions that we're better off sort of leaving as well. You know, women stereotypically and probably not so stereotypically don't like to toot our own horns. We don't like to talk about the value we bring because we think it's bragging. It makes us maybe look not uh, unlikable. And so I think you also have to kind of deal with those things in your head too. Yeah. When you know your worth, but you have to be willing to state it. Oh, you, you absolutely know. do. And you can't rely on anybody else to do that. Um, and the truth is men do it all the time. Sorry, I know you're back there on the camera, but <laughs> they do it all the time. So we have like to make guys. sure, it's, it is not bragging, right? I mean, how many of you have been in a meeting and somebody takes credit for your work? Now that's a lie and they are fine doing that, right? So you just gotta remember to let people know and it, it, there's a, a polite way to do it and I would bet you those individuals who talk about what they do also talk about what other people do too. So you have to make sure that it's not outweighing the other one, right? There's an appropriate way to do that, but please don't think other people are going to do it for you because they are not. So true. Knowing what you know now, what piece of advice would you give to your younger self? Yeah, so that's one of my favorite questions, actually. And it's interesting because we talked a little bit about the imposter syndrome, and I shared with you Joyce Roche, who's a mentor of mine, and she decided to write this book, The Empress Has No Clothes, The Imposter Syndrome, because she suffered from it. And she was asked to actually write a letter to her younger self that um, she thought was going to be sort of a small letter, and, and Oprah ended up publishing it out of the thousands that she had received. And and so she said, Oprah said to her, you should write a book. So she decided to write a book. Well, we were chatting, and I was doing a panel very similar to this of all women at Deloitte. And it was actually right when I was up for managing partner. Um, and as I said, there were no other women. This is our largest firm in the world. There is no way I'm getting this job. I was convinced that they were just checking a box to say we looked at a diverse candidate pool, et cetera, which was all fictitious, but again, we make up all kinds of things in our head, right, because we're not listening. Um, and she said to me, why don't you have the panel write a letter to their younger selves? And I sent out I, all of our partners at Deloitte, very type A, and I sent out a message, just, just write down a few things that you tell your younger self. So the first one, the younger partner, which is the one that I had sort of helped to come up, she sends off her letter to me very quickly. And she's like, look at what I did. And this is such a good exercise. And there's three other women on the email chain. And then they think, oh, I better, I got to write a letter. I got to write a letter. So then here we go. Fast forward. It's the night before our panel. I'm picking up Joyce. I get home at midnight and I have not written a letter. And I thought, are we going to just talk about the points or is there going to be something? And I, I literally sat down and I sort of scratched down these things that I would say with full knowledge that there is no way that anyone is going to ask me to read it. Like I'm going to bring out some points. And at that breakfast that morning, Joyce turns to me and she says, well, Tanisha, why don't you? And I was like, oh, my God. I felt like if there was a hole and I could climb in, that's what I was going to do. And I also thought, well, you can check off the box of becoming managing partner <laughs> because as soon as they find out, like, your story or what you would tell your younger self, you're out of there. So I'm going to share that letter with you because for me it was a game changer because it sort of gave me the permission then to be myself. I also realized that it made me more authentic to other people. And that's what we needed in a leader. Like little do we know COVID would be coming a few years later and the leaders who were most successful were those that were authentic. It wasn't the first time you saw the inside of their homes or learned that they had children, right? Um, and that really mattered. So I will share this letter with you. I'll also tell you of, of some other funny stories from this letter as well. But it starts with, Dear Tamika, you are not a mistake and you don't have to continue to prove that you weren't a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. In fact, isn't that what my great-grandmother meant when she said to my mother at the age of 18, one day you will be so happy that you have that baby. So when is that one day you continuously ask yourself as you continue to let that control you, push you, and even define you? Be brave as you can hear the whisper. One day this will all seem worth it. Someday I will make you proud. 
will strive to be amazing as you patiently wait for that day to come. I assure you, Tanika, it will come. Whether it's the day you pass the bar exam, yes, it may not be until you're 25 years old, or perhaps it's at the age of nine when you and your mother lay on the side of the road after being hit by a drunk driver, bleeding as her face is scarred from protecting you rather than herself, and the other driver was pronounced dead on the scene. Perhaps in those uncertain moments, she realized that I wasn't a mistake. Regardless, you can be certain that that day will come, and it won't be for the reasons that you thought. No, it won't be because of the letters behind your name, the amount of money that you make, the fancy shoes, seriously not the shoes, or any material things. It will simply be because of the impact that you made on the world, simply because you exist and live a life of gratitude and service to others. This is where you will find fulfillment, your purpose. There are a few things that I will also ask you to remember. One, if you could be so lucky, choose a true partner in every sense of the word, one that contributes equally and sees your success as their success. Two, create your personal brand. Three, do not compare yourself to others, live your own purpose. Four, find your true passion. Five, give the gift of experiences, time, and presence to your children and always lead by example. Six, be authentic. Seven, don't allow your struggles to take away your joy. Eight, have integrity in everything you do. Nine, remember chances favor the prepared individual. Ten, take risk. Remove fear from the equation. Don't let the acronym stand for forget everything and run, but rather face everything and rise. And finally, be authentic and or be. Be still and know that you are not a mistake. And yes, that too, please know that I am God. And today, just like every day in your life, your mother is fulfilled, your mother is whole because of you, your mother is happy she had you, and God knows, and in fact, everyone will know, you are not a mistake. Just continue to be loved. You can see I'm a night person. <laughs> I write better at night. I was going to say, if you wrote that on the fly at midnight, what would you have done if you'd had like... I would have been prepared. I worked better under pressure. <laughs> wow. I, I don't know what to say after that. That is something. Yeah, I think the, the big part of that and the reason that I'm sharing that with you is, one, because, first of all, it's important that people know that it doesn't really matter where you start, right? It's where you end and the steps that are in between. And I, I think that that's critically important. I will also tell you, and I'm going to keep myself together here, my mother sent me a note, this, a text this morning, and she said, your grandmother always said that this would be worth it or that, you know, you would... I would be so happy that I had you. And I thought, God, she still remembers and still says that. So I am really grateful because it does make a huge difference. So with Ed, See, in St. Mary's County, we're a lot closer to each other. <laughs> <laughs> what is your, I want to say proudest moment. What is the thing or one of the things that you are most proud of? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there are so many. Honestly, the fact that I would be here today is an incredibly proud moment for me. I think also just being the first in so many things, you know, there are probably many lists, quite honestly, that you're the first at, which is really unfortunate if you look at it in, you know, in its totality. But I think probably one of them, too, is being the second. So I'm the second woman to lead a large labor union. And the reality is that's what we should be striving for is not to be the first and perhaps the only, but rather to look at who we're bringing up behind us. You know, Michelle Roberts did an amazing job, and therefore they had the trust to bring another woman on. And that's what we want to make sure that we're doing. It's more about sort of what your legacy is. And so of the moments that I think are the proudest is me thinking about the legacy. You know, having my children, having a husband of 32 years, those are my proudest moments, because it's hard, all of it. Um, and, you know, knowing that it'll be worth it and that there'll be something there that sort of lasts beyond you. When you were saying that it's really kind of sad that we're so proud that you're the second, it reminds me of what Ruth Bader Ginsburg said when someone asked her, I'm paraphrasing, when will you be satisfied? There are three women on the court. Come on, isn't that enough? And she said, there were always nine men. 
why can't there be nine women? Mm -hmm. That's when I'll be satisfied. Yeah, I love that. I'll be using that when I like it. <laughs> I think we have time. We do. We have time for questions, and I know there must be many. We have a couple of mics here, so please. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for being so brave to come to the microphone. Um, so I'm Londetta Jones. I'm an associate professor in two departments and in the School of Medicine, uh, Epidemiology, Public Health, and uh, Pharmacology. So I'm trying to get myself together. You are amazing. Oh my gosh. Thank you very much. I love that letter that you wrote. I'm inspired to write one myself. Please do. But I was, I, I was curious. Um, what age or what time uh, did you feel that you could write that? Like, I mean, you, you wrote it at that time, but did you feel like maybe 10 years ago you could have wrote the same thing? Or Because everything evolves, right? And your letter 10 years from now may look different. So when do you feel that you felt you were that empowered to, to write what you just wrote? Yeah, so it is a really great question. And actually, I will also tell you because, you know, I have a great advisory personal board and many of them have said, oh my God, Tamika, don't read that. Or don't, you know, yeah, there's, it's gotta be a pretty intimate group. Like only tell that to your closest friends. And even as I was, you know, the question on um, the movie and I, or the book, and I was like, oh, I'll, I'll you know, imposter syndrome, I'll talk about it all the time. Um, and they're like, no, 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 because you're past that. Like you wanna, you wanna show that you're past that. And I thought, no, I wanna show one, a little vulnerability is what builds trust amongst people, right? And yes, it was a journey for certain because you know, my, the beginning of my career, the only thing that I saw was successful were white males. So, and they were wearing white shirts with neckties and monogram sleeves. And I was wearing white shirts and neckties with monogram sleeves because that was all that I knew. And I remember the first time someone came into the office and they had a dress on, like with flowers on. I was like, oh my God, this flower. <laughs> like, is she going to church? Like, I couldn't even like fathom it, right? Because that wasn't what I saw. But at a certain point, you do just get, and I don't know that, you know, again, I told you I knew I wasn't going to get this job as managing partner because now I've said this. But I think allowing yourself to be vulnerable, you know, developing the level of trust, I think is what we all have to do. Because the truth is you don't know the impact that that has on someone else. Now, I will say everybody's not ready. For that story, right? Um, I am selective. I didn't do it in my interview with the players, right? <laughs> but at the same time, I thought, you know what? It's important that they know who they have that's fighting for them, right? At Deloitte, we used to have this saying, like, you know, bring your authentic self to work. And, you know, I'd have lots of people saying to me, right, what does that mean? Bring my authentic self to work. Like, am I going to wear, you know, braid my hair? Am I going to wear curly? Am I not going to do this? Am I going to, you know, wear sneakers? Whatever that means to them to be their authentic selves. And the truth is, what it really means is people want to know who they're going into battle with. And if you are so confined and keep everything so personally, nobody ever gets to know you. And quite frankly, what it really means is you never build that level of trust. So if you know me as a mother, as a wife, as a you know professional, you then know more about me. You know how I tick. You know what's going to you know, make it a good day or a bad day. Those are the things that you need to know about people. Now, do you need to know what time I wake up in the morning, what my morning routine? Probably not, right? But there are certain little glimpses of your life that you have to give people so that they can connect with you. The other thing for us ladies, when other ladies see it, they can be it, right? And if they never know where you came from, they think, oh yeah, that's because Tamika grew up with both of her parents, they were millionaires, they had drove fancy cars, of course she's gonna turn out this way. No, I want them to know my mother was pregnant with me at 18 years old. She wasn't married and it can happen to you and you will be just fine because it doesn't matter where you start but it does take some time. And for those people who judge you, shame on them, right? Yeah. 
Are we going to do mindfulness? Because that's what I really want. <laughs> not start, we're not starting now. Okay. So, um, I thank you so much for being vulnerable and being authentic and expressing how much that has helped you throughout your life and your career. But I think everybody has that experience of how scary that is. And to have the courage within yourself to be able to be vulnerable and to be authentic, especially when you're in your position of a male dominant, dominated profession. So could, was there a defining moment for you when you sort of said, you know, I've been doing it everybody else's way for so long and like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Like, like you, you did just give that example mm -hmm. of you were wearing the white shirts and the tie and then a woman walked in in a flower dress. And that's a great example of, oh, well, somebody else could do it. So maybe I can too. But do you have another example within yourself where it's just like you actually had the switch go off where it's like, that's it. I'm not doing it that way anymore. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't say that it was a switch. I think, to be honest, this letter for me, which is now about 10 years old at this point, was definitely a switch. And it was a switch because I saw the reaction. I saw what it meant to other people. Um, I, I saw like other people believing that they could do that, that they could actually stay at you know a Deloitte or any of the big four and actually achieve the same thing. And to understand what the impact could be to someone else was greater than the fear that I had to not share that story, right? Um, so I think that really makes such a big difference. But it is, it's definitely hard and you do have to think about, you know, how authentic and raw you want to be. It's so funny, I worked with a gentleman and he was a business developer and that has never been the space I've been in on like more of the sales side. And he said, every time I go to a dinner or a lunch with you, we get into these like really personal conversations with clients. And he's like, I don't know how that happens. And I'm like, I don't know how it happens either. Like, I, it's not like I go in and I think I'm going to read everybody this letter, right? Like, this is way before then. But people would start to talk about their kids or the troubles that their kids had or the troubles they may be having in their marriage or whatever it might be. And those are, to be honest, some of the best clients that I have. And it's because at the end of the day, people tend to do business with people that they like, right? If you've got to be on a flight for 24 hours to Singapore, I don't want to be on with some guy that isn't going to, you know, isn't going to be able to relate to me. He doesn't like me, whatever the case might be. And so I think for me, that's how I learned it. But it also, you know, I was, I was watching a movie at one point and someone said, do you ever just lie in this movie to an, a woman? And I was thinking to myself, yeah, why do you say that? Like, you probably shouldn't. And she goes, you never have to remember anything. And it's true, if you don't have to put on these airs or act like you're doing this or, you know, or talking about my parents being married and blah, 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 then you don't ever get it wrong, right? You don't have to remember it. It's just, it's easier when you're just authentic. You're also bringing that common factor of just humanity. Like yes. we're all human and we do have so many like experiences. That's right. So why put a false face over it? Like let it just be what it really is. That's exactly right. And I think COVID, quite frankly, for all of the things that happened in COVID, it taught us a lot, right? It taught us about resilience. We all know it's a muscle now, right? And we have to exert that muscle. Like I, God willing, I never want my kids to have any challenges or difficulties, right? But the reality is, uh, you know, having those moments where everything doesn't go exactly the way they want it, where they're not getting a trophy, that's what builds the muscle. And I want them to build that muscle because the world is not an easy place. And if you start to build that muscle when you don't really need to build the muscle, I think it's a really good thing. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for being here. Your story and your journey has been completely inspirational. Uh, I'm Shawnee uh, Fleming. And so I just have a quick question. Um, I don't know, and I, you know, we're amongst friends, so I don't mean to make this sort of a counseling session, but, you know, I don't know whether I'm all in <laughs> because of my age or just because of the state of the world. I just find myself exhausted. 
right? And, you know, I keep going, I keep showing up, and I keep a smile on my face all the time. Um, but sometimes, you know, I just, I think to myself, like, how are you just going to keep at this pace, you know? And I have colleagues and I have people that talk to me, and you could just see it on their face. They're just exhausted and tired. And so I think my question for you, because you have given us probably just a very small glimpse into your journey, and I would imagine that you have some amazing stories to tell in reference to obstacles that you've had to get through. And I just, I, you know, I look at my fellow faculty of color and other staff of color and just the things that we have to go through on a daily basis. So my question for you is, how, how do you keep going? What sustains you? What's your self-care? You know, mm. help. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a quick question. Oh my God, no, but it is a great question because I would bet there are so many people in this room that feel exactly the same way. Um, it is absolutely exhausting. There is no question um, most days. I think what sustains me is that it's greater than me, right? And, you know, during the days of being at home and COVID and, you know, you had George Floyd and, you know, all of the things that were just incredibly challenging. And I thought, God, like, are we going to have one more conversation about, like, you know, what this means? Or, you know, in my mind, the knee on the neck as a metaphor for lots of experiences that many of us have had, right? Not to even minimize it by any comparison, but certainly we have had horrible experiences as well that we've had to keep going, had the ability to keep going that certainly he didn't have. But I also think about, we think about what it's going to do or what it means to other people that we do keep going. So I could, you know, sort of grovel and think, God, I got to go up to New York. I got to work tonight, right? But I know at the end of the day, it's going to make a difference for my players. I know it's going to make a difference for their children and their children. And so when I think about what the impact will be, that keeps me going. The self-care, personally, I'm not doing real well on it right now. <laughs> so I, I will start by being honest. You got me? OK, good. Um, but I, I, I think it is so critically important. I will tell you, when I came here, I hadn't been home in a couple of weeks in, in Maryland. And um, going home yesterday, it was awesome. It was like a reset for me. You know, my, I could, at one point I was on a conference call and I could hear a dog barking. And I, was, I said, to, or a Zoom, and I said to my colleague, I don't even have a dog. <laughs> And he said, but it's in your house. I'm like, yeah, I, I think I hear a dog in the house. <laughs> but I was so happy to be home that, like, nothing could bother me. And I also remember those times that your kids would run by, and you're on a Zoom, and you're like, ah, like, like people don't know you're home and that there's a family going on. And my son goes by, and I'm like, hey. And he's like, is the dog in here? I'm like, what dog? Like, but I'm thinking, you know, it was my complete reset. And I knew I needed it. I had, like, hit a wall. I was, you know, we were in Boston on Friday, San Francisco this weekend, back in New York on Monday, back in Maryland on Tuesday. I had hit a wall. And I knew I needed to reset. I knew that being here today would fill my cup. So for those reasons, I'm not doing the typical self-care, my Peloton bike or yoga, uh, but I, I am trying to get it in other ways. And I'm hoping Inky, who's my new chief of staff, will appreciate. She can start to tell me now, like, you need to go home. <laughs> Hi, thank, thank you, you so Hello. much for being here. Your story is just incredibly inspirational. And I have a statement more than a question. Um, you were telling us a little bit about your mother. And I just want to say that it sounds like she is also a pretty incredible person to have raised such a confident and caring and accomplished person in you. And so I just want to say kudos to her, too. Thank you. I so appreciate that. Thank you. My question is about your personal board of directors. You mentioned that you have a personal board of directors, and that's something that through uh, umbrella presenters, they have suggested that people do. And so I'm wondering how you use it and how you would suggest someone who's maybe entry level at your organization use a personal board of directors. Yeah, so I will say I would take it a step further. I think you should have three types of networks. I think you should have a strategic board, an operational board and a personal board, right? Strategic is really about sort of 
where you want to navigate. That's helping you with your strategy, where you're going to go, right? I think operational is who's going to help you to get it done. Like, who's going to get down there and make these things happen? And then your personal advisory board, in my opinion, typically is like who you can tell your deepest, darkest secrets to and are going to be completely honest with you. And I think you truly do need all three of them. I will also say that you will have people that overlap them, right? It could be the same people, but you have to think about them differently and recognize the value that each of them brings. I do have a phenomenal personal advisory board. It's pretty expansive, likely, but I will also say that we, I have a great group of girlfriends, and there's four of us, and we um, our names, see, I'm going back to acronyms. I didn't even know how much I liked them. <laughs> but we go by STAR. So it is Stephanie, Tamika, Asuncion, and Gina, and that spells star. Stephanie's mother, by the way, told me it spells rats backwards also. <laughs> so Stephanie, as you all know, is a former mayor of Baltimore. Um, and Stephanie Rawlings Blake, and then you have, of course, me, which is the T. A is a Sunstein, which is Sunny Austin, who is the host of The View. And then Regina, who is a lawyer for Department of Justice and, and criminal justice. And every day I receive a text from them, every single day. The, you know, it was Happy International Women's Day today. It was also about some movie I saw on the plane. I mean, it could be any and everything. And they remind me that was also the group to the one of I think the first questions, who said, don't say imposter syndrome for your book. Like, you're past that. Like, because they want to protect me, right? They don't want me to be vulnerable. They don't want someone to go back and tell them the story in the wrong way. I don't care. And they now know that that's where I am. They also are the people that tell me, like, OK, Tamika, that's the kind person talking. Let's go and, like, ask your husband, who happens to be a white male, what he would actually say. And then I want you to go do that. And sometimes I need them to say that to me, because even the four of them tell me, you're so kind. And when I went to Deloitte, the biggest thing that I did, I think, and I'm really proud about, was in 2017, when I took on the role, it was right around the time that we had a change in our administration. And literally, Washington was at odds in 2017. It was just, it, being in the city itself was so polarizing. And I could see even amongst our colleagues that people would look at each other and they were like, did you vote? Did you vote? Like, it was silly, right? <laughs> and they were not very kind. And I was like, this is terrible. And I said, you know what? We are going to be at Deloitte in the business of kindness. We are audit, tax, consulting, advisory. But the reason that people are going to want to work with us is because we are kind at the end of the day. And everybody was like, bleh, bleh, bleh. Like, <laughs> this is a corporate world. We're not going to focus on kindness. And I will tell you, I then was doing an event with the Chamber of Commerce, and it was on the business of kindness. And I sat on this board with, um, uh, sat on the panel with a woman by the name of Cynthia Germanata, who is Lady Gaga's mother. And she talked about why Born This Way Foundation was really focused on being kind and how important it was and how important that these same, which you know they call their fans the monsters who were bullying people, et cetera, would now get into the corporate world and they would continue to bully and how you really did need to have kindness in the workplace. And I will share with you that two years later, this is why exposure is important, right? It's why you show up at these things. She called me and she said, you know, we have never had anyone outside of our family and close advisors on our board. And I wondered if you would consider serving on our board. And of course, at Deloitte, we are very much into due diligence and independence. If it's a conflict, blah, blah, blah. And I said, OK, I'll, I'll ask all these questions. And they actually said to me, that we're located in San Francisco. I assume New York, because actually that's where Cynthia lives. And she said, well, we are in San Francisco because we want to be where we can make the greatest impact. And I said, well, can you tell me more about why that is? And she said, well, did you know that on the Golden Gate Bridge, there have been the most suicides ever attempted, which are over 2,000, on the Golden Gate Bridge. And we want to be where we could make a difference. And she said, there was a gentleman who came to me one day. His name was Kevin. And Kevin had actually contemplated committing suicide. And what you don't know, oftentimes people think about committing suicide, but it's not the first or the second. It's like the third or the fourth time. And for Kevin, this was going to be his fourth time. And it was going to actually take him three buses to get to the Golden Gate Bridge from his home. 
And he got on the first bus and he said, if someone looks at me and asks me how I'm doing, I'm going to turn around and go back. And no one did. And then he got on the second bus and he said, you know, if someone even smiles at me, I'm going to turn around and go back. And no one did. And then he got on the third bus and he said, you know what, I could give up on humankind, but if they just acknowledge my presence, I'm going to turn around and go back. And no one did. And his face is all blotchy, red from crying, and he gets to the top of the bridge. And a woman gives him his cell, her cell phone, doesn't even look at him, and says, could you take a picture of me? And he grabs her phone and he jumps from the bridge. True story. And he doesn't die. And he said, it is just basic human kindness, simply acknowledging that someone exists. And that resonated with me because I thought, God, if there is someone on the street that I walk by that I haven't spoken to, that could be the very difference for them. We at Deloitte, we'd get on an elevator. We own the building. And you would get on your phone so you could avoid making eye contact with people so that you don't have to speak. I mean, that's not kind. And right now, what we need the most in the world is just a little kindness. So basic human kindness. That note? Yeah. <laughs> that I just want to say thank you on behalf of everyone in this room. Um, oh, wrong side. We have a little token of our appreciation. Thank you. I love you. presents. And look, Marilyn <laughs> Colors. Who doesn't love presents? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, well, Thank unfortunately, you. Tamika has some basketball players she's going to go get a lot of money for. Yeah, I'm going to try. So she's going to be leaving us now. Thank you all. Thank you so much for having me. It actually is a perfect segue into the next very brief interlude that we are going to have here. Um, as I welcome someone to the stage in just one minute from Paul's place. And so many of you exhibited basic human kindness today when you brought supplies for the people who find themselves in need and go to Paul's place for a little bit of help. So Megan Colbertson is the Director of Development and Communication for Paul's Place, and she's just going to talk just a little bit about Paul's Place. Come on up. Thank you. This is such a great place to be on International Women's Day, I have to say, um, because we serve everyone. Um, but I really do, as Tamika said, get my cup filled up when I'm in a room of women. Um, I will tell you that that was the perfect segue and that you will find kind bars out on the table um, that you can pick up, and I'll tell you why. Um, at Paul's Place, um, it's an organization that's been around for 40 years. I see Dean Kersling here, and she's been involved for a number of years, as has the School of Nursing. Um, we run a nurses clinic, that, and we have a nurse that comes over two days a week and brings nursing students. The reflections from the nursing students are really powerful, um, just sort of talking about what they thought they were going to do and how they ended up doing the work and feeling about the work. Um, Paul's Place is an outreach center in Pigtown. It's been there since 1982. Um, started on a very small scale. Folks making sandwiches and handing them out to folks in Pigtown who were in need. We now have about 20 services. Anywhere from uh, serving lunch, we added breakfast in the fall, so we serve about 100 meals, or sorry, not 100, 1,000 meals a week. Um, we have case management services, so if you need an ID, all the way to do you need work and housing, we will help navigate those things. Because we all know, like, many of us have plenty of resources. We know what to do when we walk into the MVA. That is not true for everyone. So that can be really daunting, and so we have folks who will help just navigate some of the social services and um, departments that are out there just to get what they need in order to find employment, to get an ID, that kind of thing. We also do laundry every day. We um, are an address for someone if they don't have one. Um, 
And we also have peer recovery. So we have a peer recovery advocate who is there and will work with folks who are dealing with addiction. And the, the nurse and our peer recovery advocate often go on outreach at least once or twice a week to any of the homeless encampments. They will seek people out that are sort of known to us. If we haven't seen them for a while, they want to go and check and make sure that they are in some sort of decent shape, or if they're not, to get them to somewhere where they can be. It's a really special place. Um, I've been there for about three and a half years, and I can tell you that exactly what Tamika was describing as far as kindness, that's what we insist upon. Every day, anyone walking into Paul's place is going to be treated with dignity and respect. Um, we see the person. They're just bringing the circumstances with them. We've all dealt with things throughout our lives. People who come to Paul's Place, I think, are some of the bravest because it is very difficult, as we all know, to ask for help. So we have folks who are doing that every day and some in the most dire circumstances, and yet they do it. And so it is up to us to look them in the eye, to welcome them, to just smile, just say, hey, how are you? Um, because why not? So you will see on the kind bars a little business card size um, card um, that uh, has all of our services on it and our hours. So if you are driving home or you're driving around the city or really anywhere, especially sort of close here, because we are walkable if you're about here, um, just hand it to someone. They may know about Paul's Place and they could really use the granola bar. Um, they may not know about us, and I'm often surprised at how many folks who are out on the street don't know about us. So just hand it to them and let them know that it's a nice place to go and that they'll be taken care of there. Um, so to illustrate that, we have, I think, a short-ish video. But before that happens, I just want to really thank you all for bringing what you did. All of that's going to go a long way. Um, we either have those supplies at Paul's place and folks can ask for them, but we also put together bags that go on outreach or we will hand out at lunch so that people can take them with them. Um, toothpaste, toothbrush, pads, tampons, all of it is um, really useful, as you can imagine, to folks who don't have ready access to all of those supplies. Um, and if anyone wants to support us, you know, I am the fundraiser, so I have to say. <laughs> are welcome to do so. Um, we really do rely on individual corporate and foundation giving. Um, so without further ado. Welcome to Southwest Baltimore a diverse community made up of seven neighborhoods. And at its heart sits a small community resource center run by a dedicated staff with a very special mission, to serve the area's most marginalized and vulnerable residents in whatever way they can. Paul's Place started as a vision from a parishioner at St. John's Church in Glendon. Helen Martin's vision was to have a program in Baltimore City that was holistic in approach, that really focused on respect and dignity and the power of hope. The Pulse Ways mission is about meeting people's basic needs and supporting people to reach their goals. Um, it's about laying the foundation that's required if we're gonna start building a more equitable society. The mission of Paul's Place is to serve those who are less fortunate or who are experiencing homelessness or on the verge of homelessness that can use the resources that we have to provide to them. Not only just walk-in case management, not only just clothes and food, um, we're also a shoulder to lean on, someone to talk to. Our clothing bank, which is really for families or individuals to be able to come and find clothing um, for just everyday life, and then also sometimes back to school clothing for, for their kids. Um, and then our hot lunch is five days a week for really what is our core signature program, um, which is making sure that if somebody has food insecurity, that we have a meal for them. We welcome everybody to come and eat. The type of meals I like to cook are wholesome and hearty meal that will get folks coming back, you know, and like really talking about, you know, the meals at Paul's Place. 
I just really enjoy what I do. Outside of the soup kitchen, which most people know what that is, we do a lot of different things from uh, community outreach to substance abuse support and education, to after school programming, to allowing people to take a shower, get their mail, get benefits, get identifications done um, so they can get a job, and now starting a culinary arts program where we're gonna train a whole bunch of people to work in the restaurant industry. Groundwork Kitchen is the newest program of Paul's Place. Um, throughout the years, Paul's Place has offered a variety of employment supports and case management services, and Groundwork Kitchen is really bringing those two worlds together in the one sort of cohesive picture. Over the next few episodes, Better for Baltimore brings you the stories of Paul's Place, the services they provide to the communities of Southwest Baltimore and the people who make it happen. So yes, there are more. So you can go on our YouTube channel and watch the other ones. Um, those were created for us last year. We're about to do an update. But thank you so much for giving me some time. Um, I'm so glad that you all do this. And um, yeah, I appreciate the work that you're doing. And hopefully, I'll see you all around. Hey, we are going to take a break in just a few minutes, but our next very important segment of today's program is our Umbrella Awards. This is our third annual series of awards, and Crystal Edwards uh, chaired the awards committee, and I'm going to let her take it away in one moment. I also am pleased to have a very special guest with us. I think if um, you've been following our awards program and our symposium every year, you know that President Gerald is the artist behind the award, the Umbrella Award, and he has passed the torch, literally and figuratively, to his daughter, Gwyneth. And she is an alumnus of our nursing school and is on faculty at the nursing school, aren't you? Ah, in the DMP program. All right. And she's going to help uh, Crystal give the awards today. Crystal. I'm so pleased to be here with all of you this afternoon to be able to celebrate the accomplishments of everybody in this room. I also recognize three important recipients for this year's Umbrellas Awards. So I'd like to start by inviting our first Umbrella Award recipient for the year, Jennifer Chapman. Jennifer Chapman, please come on up, Jennifer. <laughs> We're recognizing Jennifer Chapman this year as the Person of the Year on the Rise Award. Jennifer has thrived and excelled in her role because she eagerly takes advantage of all opportunities that facilitate her professional growth and development, which in turn, she pours back into supporting others, other members of our community. Her professional growth has blossomed since she started at the Law Library as a research fellow. Faculty praise her for her exceptional work that she provides to support their scholarship and teaching. Not only does she provide reference support to the law school community and members of the public, she also actively elevates the profile of UMB through her work as an active member of several library associations, authoring articles, and presenting papers. Even through times of personal loss, Jennifer has remained steadfastly conscientious and committed to excellence in her work. And for that, we would like to acknowledge her as this year's Person of the Year on the Rise. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. 
please stay there because we're going to have everybody take a, a group photo at the end. Thank you so much. Our next recipient this year, winning the person of the year leading the way, is Safe Pool. Come up, Safe. <laughs> Safe a Pool consistently supports the advancement of women at UMB, and her work aligns with the principles of the mission of Umbrella. Utilizing the teachings of Umbrella to advocate for herself and her women colleagues, Pool was instrumental in establishing the UMB Professional Administratives Committed to Excellence, or UMB PACE, a group that champions and supports UMB's administrative professionals. In connection with our leadership in UMB PACE, who also helped to create and implement a mentoring program to support new and current administrative professionals at the university. By taking advantage of professional development opportunities like the Workplace Mission Service Program and this year's UMB Emerging Leaders Cohort, she shows her dedication to helping and supporting others at UMB. Her efforts provide many UMB staff in, with resources, encouragement, and professional development opportunities that may otherwise not exist. Congratulations again to this year's Umbrella Bear with me. As I acknowledge the last recipient of this year's Umbrella Awards, the 2023 Champion of the Year goes to Deborah Prout. Come on up, Deborah. <laughs> Deborah Prout champions women at all levels in her role as a special assistant to the dean in the School of Nursing. She's lauded for her unwavering devotion to her work, which has wide influence on many people at the School of Nursing. By supporting and showcasing the work of faculty, staff, and students, many of whom who are women, Prout upholds the spirit of the mission of Umbrella. When tasked with preparing nominations for people at the School of Nursing, being considered for awards and honors, she goes above and beyond to coach them through the process. Her work often helps highlight the accomplishments of others, encouraging their professional development and supporting their professional journey. Congratulations again to Deborah Prout, this year's Champion of the Year. Please join me in congratulating all of this year's award recipients for the 2023 Umbrella Awards. It has been a wonderful, wonderful day. And what we are going to do now is sort of take it down a couple of notches. We've heard from so many wonderful, innovative leaders today and what we're going to do now is try to channel everything that we learned earlier and bring it all within ourselves and learn well maybe we've already if you already know how to be mindful you can enhance your mindfulness if you don't know how we're going to learn a little bit about that so i'm so happy to have back um allison who was with us two years ago when we did women's history month virtually 100% virtually. So she is the founder and CEO of Zensational Kids, and she's going to talk with us about some tools and techniques to manage stress. Allison. Okay, can everybody hear me? Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. It's so great. Um, to be here with all of you today in person. Last time I was, like, as Jennifer said, virtually, which is great too, everybody in their privacy in their own space, but there's something about the collective energy of us all being together that is incredibly special. Um, 
So today, you know, I wanted to talk about, you know, leading with clarity, calm, and compassion, because I think it's easy for us to all say, like, wow, if I can embody those things, just life would be so much easier. Yes? Yes. And um, one thing that was just so inspiring today with Tamika is her talking about her vulnerability and her willingness to be authentic and put herself out there and lift other people up and really be a helpful force. And I think we could all say, like, I want to be more like that, yes? Like, raise your hand if you could say, like, yeah, yeah, like, I'm all for that, too. And one of the things that I, I, you know, I speak often for school districts, really, working with educators. And educators feel all of that, too, of, of wanting to really help those that they work with, really serve others and lift them up. And I think that the greatest barrier that we have right now, and I don't know who, I think it was you, and I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, but when you asked Tamika the question, or just the statement of, but I'm just exhausted, how many of you can relate to just feeling exhausted. Yeah, and I, I think that I almost feel like COVID has made that a bit worse. We, we are actually a bit more exhausted at, because we're trying to do more, or we're trying to balance more, we're trying to balance how we worked before, how maybe we parented before, and how we can, like the possibility of how we can now. And we're trying to find some balance in all of that. But what I know for sure is like when we are at the point of just feeling physically exhausted, we really don't have a lot of inner resources within ourselves to care for ourselves. Because even when we're exhausted, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this, you will much sooner care for somebody else before yourself. Yes? I think that's the nature of being a woman also. So what I'm hoping that, that you will gain from our hour or so together are some tools that you can use for yourself to boost your own inner resources of self-care, of compassion, of managing your own inner state. If you could please go to the, to the next slide. I really have to give up control here because I don't have a clicker. <laughs> You're making it easy for me, but it's kind of hard. Um, so um, just to back up a little bit of who I am and what I do. So Jennifer told you I am the founder and CEO of a company called Zensational Kids. And what we do is we work with schools to help teach educators and students how to boost and cultivate their own inner resources of understanding how to manage your mind, manage your body, manage your emotions. And it's all related to managing your stress and your own personal well-being. Myself, I came to this work from being a pediatric occupational therapist. So I have always been fascinated about human development, about neuroscience, about biology, and about our own physiology. And when I started to study such things as yoga and meditation and mindfulness, while on one hand, this is about 15 years ago, I noticed how I myself began to manage more of my inner state, how my own inner state started to be calmer, be more present, take more of a pause before I would respond. And I noticed that through this change within me, things outside of me 
started to change, mostly because I ended up showing up differently. And what we now know, really from the science, and everything that I teach now is really science-based. So everything I'm going to share with you, we know that when we're engaged in these practices, we are changing the neurocircuitry in our brain. Because when our neurocircuitry is stuck in, I'm exhausted, I'm angry, I'm fed up, I am disgusted, I am overwhelmed, we know that those inner states really are activating the primitive parts of our brain that keep us in this loop of survival and really activate this stress mode within our nervous system. So when we start practicing mindfulness, and we're going to do some breath work and um, some affirmations and some body work, we know that we're able to switch that neurocircuitry loop within our brain. And rather than relying on this impulsive, survival-based part of our brain, which is the back of the brain, what we start to do is create more neurocircuitry going to the front of our brain. This is our prefrontal cortex. This is our very, very much human mind. And within the human part of our mind, we have our executive functions. And this is the part of our brain that gives us self-control. It helps us to self-monitor. It's the way that we can calm ourselves down. It's our ability to problem solve, make decisions, um, complete tasks to initiate things. So I'm prefacing what we're going to do today with that because what I always like people to know is because sometimes people are like, oh, this is just foo-foo. You're just having me stop and take a couple of breaths. Like, yeah, great, it's right now, but it's fine for right now. And maybe I feel a little bit better, but like, okay, really? What I, what I want to share with you is through everything that we're going to practice together today, you are changing your brain. You're changing your brain. And as you create this change, you're changing your inner state. And the wonderful thing about what I'm going to share with you, the practices we're going to share with you, is we're not going to be sitting with our eyes closed for 20 minutes. These are short little practices. They're, they're micro moments that you can do when you're walking down the street, when you're walking to your car, when you're going to the bathroom. You could take a minute or two to do some of the things that I'm going to share with you. And each time, you're changing your brain. You're changing your inner chemistry. You're changing a little bit about how you feel. And this is how we build our inner resources, one little bit at a time. So with that being said, why don't we start with a little bit of intention setting, okay? So a short little practice. So if everybody could sit back in your chairs, if you want to turn your chairs so you're facing me, so you're not all twisted in your chair, that might be helpful. Okay, and make sure your feet are on the floor. One of the reasons why um, in seated mindfulness practices, we have your feet on the floor, is that it's very important that you yourself, in your mind, in your body, you feel safe. So when our feet are on the floor, we kind of energetically are being held by the earth. Okay, so feet on the floor is a sense of safety. Just bring your hands to your lap. And gently close your eyes. Okay, and I call this like a five-point check-in. So first, just notice your breath. Notice that you're breathing in and out. Nobody needs to teach you how to do that. You automatically know how to do that. And maybe you just become a little bit curious about the quality of your breath. So what do I mean by that? Is your breath long and deep? Is it short and scattered? Does it feel warm? Does it feel cold? There's no right answer here. 
I'm just inviting you to be curious about your breath. And when we're curious, it holds your attention there a little bit longer. So directed attention. And there's no judgment. And now bring your attention just to your mind. Notice, are there thoughts moving in and out? Are you just paying attention to the sound of my voice? Is there some persnickety thing that your mind is telling you? Just notice, again, not with judgment. This is just you in this moment. And now bring your attention to your body. Notice if there's any sensations present in your body. It could be things like, I'm hot, I'm cold, I feel tension, I feel ease. You're just being curious, giving yourself a moment to check within. And now notice if there are any emotions that come up. How are you feeling right now? Or maybe how have you been feeling lately? Or maybe how have you been feeling just today? What emotions seem to be sparking something in you today? And now I'd like you to think of a word or two that you would like to embody a bit more. Like what would you like to invite into your inner space right now? Perhaps it's a bit more peace or ease or joy or love. What's your word? And if you, even two or three come up, that's fine. But what do you feel like you really could use a bit more of? And then what I'd like you to do is imagine that there is a golden light over your head. And that light shines down right to the top of your head. And just like water being poured from a faucet, whatever your word or your few words are, imagine that those words are being poured from that golden light into the top of your head. They enter the crown of your head and fill your whole brain. It fills your face, your shoulders, your heart, your arms, all the way down to your fingers. It fills your chest cavity, fills your lungs, fills your ribs, down to your belly. The words wrapped in this golden light fill your hips, down your legs, to your ankles, down to the bottom of your feet. So imagine that your whole body is glowing with these words, these intentions that you've set for yourself. And take a moment and just notice how that feels. Filling yourself up with what you need. Now before we open our eyes, let's together, we're gonna take three breaths together. So breathe in through your nose. 
and breathe out through your mouth. Again, breathe in through your nose and breathe out through your mouth. Last time, breathe in through your nose and this time breathe out through your nose. Take a moment and just notice how you feel from the inside out. Notice for yourself, how do you feel? And when you're ready, just flutter your eyes open and bring yourself back to this space. So words are very powerful because words have energy. And we're very, very quick to hold on to the words based on what we see right in front of us or how we feel in the midst of what's in front of us. And lately, I think a lot of the words are overwhelmed, tired, frustrated, angry. But the more we keep saying those words and noticing that those feelings within us, the more that those things are going to perpetuate within us. And now it takes a little bit of work, but I'm sure that whatever word you picked for you, you have evidence that it already exists there every day. But what we tend to do is we, I mean, this is the human brain, we tend to focus more on the negative. So when I say it takes work, it takes work to remember. It takes work to say these words to ourselves over and over again, even if when you wake up in the morning and you write them down and you put them on the mirror or you put them on your car, rear view mirror, we remember the words that we intentionally want to embody and carry with us because how we show up, what is within us, is going to always be reflected in our outside world. So if we can remember to carry our intentions with us, we're more likely to see a world that reflects that back to us. All right, so here's another thing that I would like to share with you. It's ways that we can move our body to help release all of the angst and the stress that we feel. So everybody knows exercise is wonderful for us, right? Um, And I think probably a great barrier for us to really exercising every day is desire. No. Um, is time, right? You work a long day, you're exhausted, you come home, you cook dinner. Like, who's, who's going to the gym? But here's what we know um, about, about movement. For many of us, we have stress, trauma, adversity, all of these things that... Um, tense our body and inhibit our well-being, it's not just here. It's not that we have these thoughts that we just want to throw away. It really does reside in our body. So the wonderful thing about exercise is it gives us a way to release it. So what I'd like to do is teach you a quick way, a quick little routine so that you can release it on your own. Okay, so I'm going to have you all stand up, please. Okay, so I already told you I work a lot in schools. Okay, so I'm going to say to you what I say to the eighth graders, because eighth graders are the hardest. Okay, first I'm going to ask you, raise your hand if you've ever felt really, really stressed out. I think I have everybody. Okay. Um, Raise your hand if you'd like to learn something that you can do very, very quickly that'll help shift your stress to a better feeling place. So notice I'm not saying I'm getting rid of your stress, but I'm going to help you feel a bit better. You would like to, you would like to learn it? Yes? I need everybody's hand. (laughs) 
I will say that to eighth graders too. All right, so I, I just got to tell you, it's going to seem a little weird, okay? And it's a little weird because probably what I'm going to do with you, you've never really done before, let alone with a bunch of colleagues and other professional people here. Um, it's going to be a little bit weird, but we're all, it's only going to be maybe like four or five minutes. Is that okay? So you all agree, like we could all just be weird a little bit together? Okay, but we're also, it's gonna be kind of like a science experiment because you'll get to decide whether or not like, huh, that felt good or I'm never doing that again. <laughs> Everybody's in? Yep. Awesome, you guys are great. All right, we're gonna start, well, put your feet about hip distance apart so you have a good base of support. And we're gonna start with tapping the top of our head. So you're just gonna use your fingertips like raindrops tapping the top of your head. Okay, and then we're gonna move to the back of our head. Now, while you're doing this, you want to be deeply breathing in and out through the nose. A lot to concentrate on, right? Okay, come to the forehead. And then the side of your eyes, like your temples. Remember, you're breathing. Come to under the eyes, like your cheekbones. Breathing at your own pace, in and out through your nose. Come to underneath your nose, so above your upper lip. Now below your lower lip, so on top of your chin. Now you're gonna come to just below your collarbone. So these are all energy centers of our body. So we're helping open up the flow of energy. You're gonna come to the center of your chest. Okay, now you're gonna take your whole hand and you're gonna start tapping one shoulder. It's like you're giving yourself like, good job. Good job, good job. You're gonna tap down your arm and then flip your hand over, tap up. Remember, breathing in and out through your nose. Tap up, tap down, tap up, one more time. And then come over to the other side. Tap down and up, and down. You actually all don't look as weird as I thought you were gonna look. It's good. One more time, up down and now come to your chest like a Tarzan you're gonna tap down your belly to your hips then you can make little fists with your hands and you're gonna tap like right above your hips like by your kidneys like a little drum all right then we're gonna tap down the front of our legs and up the back of our legs One more time, down, 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 down. Up, 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 up. Take a big breath in, reach your arms all the way up. You're gonna tighten every muscle in your body. Tight, 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 tight. Then as you exhale, you're gonna bounce and just shake, 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 shake. Really bounce, really bounce, really bounce, nice. Okay, we're gonna do that again. Big breaths in, reach all the way up. Make everything tight, 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 tight. We call this like frozen butter. Frozen butter. Exhale, bounce and melt. <sighs> Last time. Big breath in. Tight, tight, tight. Hold that breath in. Exhale, shake and bounce. Shake, shake, shake and bounce. We're going to stay here for a count of ten. Okay, one. Two, <laughs> three, four, five, six, seven, eight, <laughs> nine. Get her on film. Ten. Very nice. Big breath in, arms out to the side. 
Big breath out. Give yourself a nice, tight hug. You can even say to yourself, I love you. you can say that to yourself. Big breath in, arms out. Cross them over. Big squeeze. Say to yourself, I love you. Love you. You're so awesome. All right. Big breath in. And arms down, out. Okay. Place your palms forward. Close your eyes for a moment, and let's tune in. Turn your attention inward again. Just allow yourself to feel. Notice what you feel right now. It might not be a swarming in word. Maybe you notice different sensations. Maybe you notice some flow of energy or blood in your body. Just what do you notice? Notice if possibly there's a bit more ease that's present and available. William James said, by changing the internal state of the mind, people can change the outer aspects of their lives. Okay, with what we're doing right now, you're changing the inner aspect of your body, of your mind. Okay, and when you're ready, you can flutter your eyes open, bringing yourself back to the room. Was that worth doing something a little weird? <laughs> yeah, awesome. Okay, come sit down. Next slide, please. Um, also, before I forget to mention, on each table, there's a piece of paper with a QR code. I created, um, it's kind of like a self-care workbook for you. It's about, I don't know, 15 or 16 pages, but you can scan that QR code. And many of the practices that I'm sharing with you today are in that workbook along with some others. Um, because what I am very, very much passionate about is supporting you and being able to do these. I mean, I consider these really short, sweet little exercises to help you build your own resilience, resilience and your own ability to constantly find states of inner clarity, calm, and compassion. So... Um, so please remember to, to check out that QR code. Okay, your breath. Your breath has the power to consistently bring you back home to your true self. So your true self is all those intentions that you let come in through that beautiful golden light. Your true self is you are joy, you are goodness, you are happiness, you are kindness, you are grace, you are power, you are courage, you are brave. You are all of those things, okay? But often the world around us gets us stuck, gets us really, really stuck and overwhelmed. The beautiful thing about our breath of always being available to call us back to that inner self. Our breath has the power to shift our nervous system, to shift our nervous system and to shift that neurocircuitry that I talked about when I began today. So the thing about our breath, while we all do it so perfectly well, right? You're all alive, right? So you're all breathing. It's that we have the power to shift and manipulate how we breathe to change our neurocircuitry and our neurochemistry, which is so cool that we can do that. So I'd like to teach you a few ways of how you can make that happen within yourself. So we're going to come back to that position that we started with, with our feet on the floor and our hands in our lap and our spine nice and tall in our seat. Okay, and once again, I'm going to have you close your eyes. And the reason for having you close your eyes is that we're so visually distracted. We're like 
you know, information monsters. Our sensory systems are always looking for information. But right now, I'd like you to turn everything inward so it just is helpful when you close your eyes. And once again, bring your attention to your breath. Notice you are breathing in and out. This happens naturally. Nobody needs to teach you how to do this. You know how to do it. And now I invite you to very gently place one hand over your heart and one hand on your belly. And I'd like you to get curious here. As you breathe, get curious about how your hands move with your inhale and exhale. So as you breathe in, can you feel maybe your hand on your belly or your hand on your heart moving outward? And as you exhale, do you feel them moving closer to your spine? So investigate this for yourself for a few breaths of what do my hands do as I breathe. Know that the hand on your heart is over your upper two lobes of your lungs and the hand in your belly can sense the inflation and deflation of the large lower lobes of your lungs. And now I'd like you to call upon your visualization a little bit. As you inhale, imagine that your body is an empty glass of water. And as you're breathing in, you're sipping in water. It's filling the bottom of the cup. So as you breathe in, your belly is going to expand. And once your belly is fully expanded, your heart will expand. And then as you exhale, everything relaxes. So your breath in begins to fill the belly, then the ribs, then the heart. And then your exhale just empties the cup. I know for some this may feel very peculiar. That's why I say use your imagination to make this happen. Breathe in to the belly then the ribs and the heart, then exhale, empty the cup. Repeat that a few more times. I'm also going to invite you to recall that intention word that you set for yourself in the beginning. And as you breathe in, say to yourself, I am. And on the exhale, repeat that word. So it may be, I am calm, or I am patient, or I am joyful, whatever your word is but we could use these few breaths to remind our mind and our body what we want, what we want to embody. And then together, let's take another big breath in through the nose and out through the nose. Again, in through the nose and out through the nose. Keeping your eyes closed, just release your hands and let them come back down to your lap. And then take another moment and just notice how you feel. How does your inner space, your inner environment feel right now? And when you're ready, just flutter your eyes open to come back into the room.
So I know from teaching this to you know, thousands and thousands of people that for many, when I say, breathe in and fill your belly first, they're like, what? Air doesn't go there. Like, I'm just, here's where my air is. It goes here to fill my lungs. I promise you <laughs> that breath does move your belly. Okay, many of you I'm sure have heard of belly breathing. Now, we all know how to breathe in that way, belly first and then heart or collarbone because babies are born breathing that way. It is our natural state of breathing because this pattern of breathing turns on the part of our nervous system that tells our body and brain to rest and digest, opposed to that part of our nervous system that tells our body to like, go, 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 go. Right, we have these two branches. When we breathe into our belly, it's called the parasympathetic nervous system. Breathing into the belly turns on that parasympathetic nervous system. So you don't have to tell your mind, stop rambling. You don't have to tell your body, settle down. Your body automatically will do it when you breathe into your belly several times in a row. The challenge is that when we lead lives that are very stressful, when we lead lives where we are compulsively doing, 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 going, going, going. We need to stay in a stressed state in order to be able to keep up at that pace. It's not normal. It's also not healthy. So what happens is that our sympathetic nervous system stays engaged and on. And when that happens, our body produces cortisol consistently. And we know that this is something that does breed disease in our body. It is not part of wellness. Balance is part of wellness. So having a tool like this, and I always say in your back pocket, is really, really handy. Because even though I would say probably, I, didn't, I can't see from here who could, who's breathing into their belly and who's not. But from my experience, 50% of you probably were not breathing into your belly right now. I promise you, if you practice this a little bit, not for a half hour, every time you think of it, put your hand on your belly and say, breathe into my belly. If you practice this, it will not take you long. It could take maybe a couple of days, maybe, maybe a week. You will feel it. And you will have that control valve in your back pocket to help switch your inner state to a greater state of calm by just changing your pattern of breath. And this is very powerful because when you are able to change your pattern of breath, you change the neurocircuitry, you change the hormones running through your body, you change that inner environment. And we know when you change the inner environment, what happens on the outside? It changes. It changes. It changes. I don't know about you, but I would much prefer to have an outer environment that is calm and joyful, respectful, and compassionate. Anybody else? Okay, so I know that one of the quickest ways to do that is through me first. So when I was um, practicing as a pediatric occupational therapist in schools, um, I don't know about you in your work environment, but I had a lot of people that uh, really stressed me out. <laughs> Anybody experienced that? Right? You know, like the teacher that was always complaining about something or wanted me to do something that wasn't in my job description. Um, and I would recall when I first learned about 
using this breathing technique, I remember walking down the hallway of the school encountering a force coming at me that I typically would want to turn around and run the other way. I would see them coming and I would just breathe. Breathe into my belly, walk. And sometimes I'd use those affirmations or intentions. And this is quick. I'm not talking about like a long hallway. It was in elementary school, not that long. But it would change that interaction tremendously. Tremendously. So I task you of trying that out and then emailing me and telling me. <laughs> All right, can we have the next slide? I just want to check my time here. Okay. So it is very easy for us to become overwhelmed by the energy of other people, like my example of the teacher coming at me with everything that they wanted me to do, all of these, all of these things, and then me becoming overwhelmed by the energy that they bring to a situation or a confrontation or an interaction. Have any of you walked into a room and you just, you feel it? You feel the energy immediately? So what I'm hoping you will learn or you will practice is how you don't become the energy that's in the room. You be the energy in the room. And I know that you all have the power to do this, whether you're aware of it. It helps if you're aware of it. But even if you're not, there's a miraculous thing that our nervous system does. Our nervous system, based on how we're feeling, has a vibration, a frequency. And what we innately know how to do is match that vibration or that frequency of another nervous system. In development, we call it co-regulation. And babies are not born knowing how to calm themselves. They learn how to bring their nervous system to a state of calm by matching the nervous system state of a calm caregiver. We innately know how to do this. Our biology and our physiology knows how to do this our entire life long. So what I'm sharing with you is a realization that you have the power by focusing your nervous system into a state that you own. No matter what's happening there, I and peaceful. You're not going to rock it for me. I am calm. I am courageous. I am bold and I am compassionate. And I'm going to be that so that by this co-regulatory force, you can be that too. But I am not going to become your fear your anger, your overwhelm, or your stress. Because I got enough of that on my own, on my own time. <laughs> right? But we all have the power to do this. But it takes awareness. And it's a little bit of work. I'm hoping that what I'm sharing with you is the work. Right? That you learn how to shift this for yourself. And, um, you know, when Tamika was here and I asked her about her being vulnerable and being authentic, right? In order to, I, I truly believe, like, you have to have courage for that, right? That is an inner state. It's not just a will of your mind. Like, you need to have that and 
feel that in your body and be aware of that, of that strength. So what I'm hoping that you, you realize is that whatever it is that you want to embody, you can with awareness, with stating it, and with owning it, and being it. All right, can we have the next slide? And here's where we sometimes become derailed. So our mind is a very powerful, powerful muscle. When we learn to be aware of what it feeds us, and when we learn how to focus it in the direction where we want it to be. So like I said earlier, the the human mind has a propensity towards negativity. And that just comes from us ancestrally because you have to know where the danger is all the time so that you could stay alive. But really, our only saboteurs right now are really really our thoughts. And when the human mind has the capacity to shift 60 to 80,000 thoughts per day, we're not conscious of most of them. So many of them that lay in the subconscious, what we're not aware of, are the things telling us, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. This is the imposter syndrome. Right? You're not good enough for that. They're going to find out that you don't really like know everything, like somebody else could be better. These are all the subconscious thoughts. So what I'd like to share with you right now is a way where we could welcome all of our thoughts, notice all of our thoughts, because in our awareness of our thoughts, we have the ability to stand above them. We have the ability to say which thoughts are, they're just garbage. They were programmed there from some other time. And which are the thoughts like, hell yeah, those are the things I want to remember. Those are the things that are going to keep me in my power, in my grace, in my calm today. But many of us, when we sit and we listen to all of it, it's not fun, is it? It's like a battleground in there. So we're going to just take a couple of minutes to sit, and I'm going to guide you to follow those thoughts, to just notice them, as if you are a bystander looking at them pass by. And we're going to let them pass. Because here's another thing that that I know. What you resist persists. What you resist persists. Okay. So let's come to a comfortable seat. Again, I think we have another just, yeah, we're going to just take about three minutes for this, two or three minutes. Um, Let your hands come to your lap. Take a moment to gently close your eyes. And let's imagine that we all went to a beautiful park. I'm sure there's a nice park somewhere here. And you're just laying down on your back on the cool grass of this park. And as you breathe in, you feel the cool grass all against the back of your body. And as you breathe out, you feel the warmth of that sun, because spring is almost here. So your breath in helps you to feel the cool of the grass. And your breath out allows you to feel the warmth of the sun. And as you're here in this safe space, just simply relaxing, you notice the beautiful blue sky and the clouds passing by. And as you rest here, you will notice that your mind, in your stillness, will immediately want to keep you busy. That's what the mind does. It's its role. It's its job. You're just the bystander right now, watching the fluctuation, the play of the mind. So notice the thoughts that come in. 
Don't push them away, just notice them. Acknowledge the thought and then place it in a cloud up in the sky and let it just softly drift away. Just release the thought. See if you can slow the thoughts down enough so that you could truly notice what the thought is. But once you notice it, place it in the cloud and let it pass. If your mind starts to wander so much that you forget the task at hand, just remind your mind what you're doing right now. And then together, let's take a deep breath in through our nose. So breathe in and breathe out. One more time, breathe in and breathe out. Last time, big breath in through your nose. Now as you breathe out, just imagine letting all the clouds drift by clear sky. Clear sky. And when you're ready, gently flutter your eyes open, bringing yourself back to this space. So if you were in eighth grade, I would have you write down your thoughts. Whatever it was that came up on a piece of paper, write them all down. And then I would have you take a red marker and cross out every thought that was just mean, was a worry, was something when you read it just stressed you out. Cross out all of those thoughts. And any thought that came through your mind that was one of, I'm awesome, this feels good, I know I'm going to do great today. Any thought that was positive, stating your worthiness and your awesomeness, circle it. Now, in that task, many times, for every 10 negative thoughts, there's only one or two positive ones, but that's okay, because this is part of brain training. And then what I would have you do is write down the thoughts that you want your brain to say to you. Write them down. Because as you think, you become. Whatever it is that you say to yourself, whether you're aware of the thought or not, you become that. It's like your internal instruction. And this is why a practice like this is so powerful because very often we don't realize how much garbage our mind sends us sometimes. But this is your path for rewiring reprogramming that for yourself so that in the foreground you're saying to yourself positive things but then the positive things start to inhabit in the background as well and it is all within our power so i hope that with the few practices that we had time to share together today there's something, at least one thing that we did, that you will practice again, maybe even later this evening. And if there's nothing that you can remember, please scan the QR code um, because it'll pop up immediately the workbook. And within it, there are scripts of some of these practices. Um, one last thing that I want to say is 
it's wonderful if there are people in your home or colleagues that you can share these things with. But know that just by you embodying these things, showing up differently, you are creating a change for those people around you as well. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. So I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, okay, great, wonderful. Okay, thank you very much. Allison, thank you. I, do the eighth graders get nap time when you're finished? <laughs> I need a nap after all that breathing. All right, thank you so, so much. We have one final little spotlight, a little bit similar to what we did earlier with Megan in Paul's place. And we want to give Peg McCarthy, who is from the professor and chair at the School of Medicine, a few minutes to talk about the President's Council for Women. I hope all of you have heard of the President's Council. It is similar, but very different, similar to Umbrella, yet very different. And I want to give Peg a few minutes to talk about it. Thanks, Jennifer. That was actually going to be my first question, is how many of you have heard of the PCW? Okay, we need to do better, and that's, that's partly why I'm here. So as Jennifer said, we are different but overlapping with Umbrella. Next slide, please. So who, who are we? Uh, we were, it was initiated by President Jay Perman as one of his last uh, official acts, um, and then it was carried on by President Gerald after that, uh, thank goodness. Uh, I have been the chair since its initiation and have had two co-chairs. Um, right now we have Patty Alvarez and um, Susan Buskirk as our co-chairs. Uh, we have representations from every single unit on the campus, and I literally mean every single unit. Uh, well, I should be careful. <laughs> Never say absolutely everything. Uh, very, very, very broad representation across the campus at every rank, from staff, trainees, faculties, deans, and VPs the interim president of the Midtown Hospital on the council. And our total membership fluctuates around 40 people. Next slide. Our mission is to foster an environment of equity, opportunity, and fulfillment for all women in the UMB campus. And that means that we try to find issues that cross cut to affect all women, right? And that is actually one of our challenges because uh, women at different ranks and in different positions often have unique challenges, but there are some that are common to all of us. Next question. And our purpose is to take on a leadership role, participate in and have a voice in the development of institutional initiatives, policies, and procedures to ensure such efforts are equitable and inclusive. PCW will partner with other entities with overlapping goals to implement tactics identified in the university's strategic plan in order to achieve any gender equity goals. Next slide, please. So our collaborators are obviously Umbrella. Uh, WIMS is a women in medicine and science group, and then there are additional small uh, women's groups in some of the other schools that we need to liaison with better. And then the, uh, the DAC, the, the Diversity uh, Advisory Committee, which is now under um, Diane Berthoud, Forbes Berthoud's uh, office who we're also working with very closely. Next slide, please. We have four subcommittees, the Gender Equity and Access Committee. This is to just look at things like promotion rates, salaries, et cetera, that opportunities are equal. The Family Committee, which is mostly focused on child care. Uh, the Gender and Discrimination Committee, the same thing to make sure that we have the actual data to show that we're getting good representation. And then the Education Ag Ag Advocacy and Awareness Committee, which is not to, uh, is not to do educational activities but to educate people about uh, the, um, the PCW and make sure that we can get everyone engaged because the more we get you all knowing about us and engaged, the more you can bring issues to us to be addressed. Next slide. And our achievements are we, um, during the pandemic, we were hit with the pandemic pretty quickly after we were established. Uh, uh, Jenny Owens established a parenting and pandemic affinity support groups for uh, parents of different age groups, and that was very helpful to a lot of, of parents. We created and uh, posted the PCW top 10 suggestions for supervisors of women and trainees and their employees during the pandemic. 
Uh, we held an open forum discussion around race, gender, and intersectionality after the killing of George Floyd. Uh, and this was led by Julia Dickerson and was very impactful for those of us who uh, were privileged to participate. We brought attention to uh, school and campus surveys on salary equity and kept kind of pushing to make sure that those occurred. We proposed a financial incentive by campus to offer childcare costs uh, which led to the campus implementation of the UMB child care uh, grants that we now have. We're keeping very close tabs on that. We think that there needs to be a lot more work done in that space. That is the one truly cross-cutting issue for all of us uh, is access to affordable, high-quality health uh, child care. And then we encourage uh, gender equity in major recruitment, such as deans, et cetera. Whenever one occurs, the search committee gets a letter from us saying, you know, we're watching. Make sure that you get plenty of candidates. Uh, next slide, please. And our future goals are to bring uh, attention and support to students who are parents. Our student body is an older student body. Uh, we need to extend the UMB Child Care Grant to students right now. They are not uh, considered eligible. Uh, we are working with the Title IX office to sort of tweak our workplace uh, harassment and hostility training to be more appropriate to a university setting and less corporate. Ensure adequate coaching access for trainees who are women, which I think that's been well attended to by Umbrella and other entities. Seek campus-wide consistency in exit interviews as well as implement implementing Why Do You Stay interviews, which has been modeled by the School of Nursing, contribute to the future of work effort and to increase uh, visibility and effectiveness. And uh, our big challenges are getting our visibility, trying to meet all the diverse needs. If you have any ideas or thoughts, you want to participate in any way, please shoot me an email. And, find. and thanks very much, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Jeff. Thank you, Peg. I think an important thing to note um, and Peg just briefly touched on it. The PCW is more of a policy-oriented organization, um, and it is advisory to the president. So a lot of the work that they do is to make sure that we have the policies in place, fix the policies that need fixing, and um, make sure that those policies are being adhered to. And Peg, one of your um, accomplishments there was making sure that we have um, um, focus on uh, equity in searches, and I am very pleased to say, out of our um, eight deans, seven schools, and the dean of the library, five of those eight deans are women. So, yay to that. Okay, so, long day. Is it okay to drink before four o'clock? Um, so I, I just want to let you know that there will be a survey that you will be getting, and we really encourage you to fill it out because we do pay attention. And I made a joke about drinking before 4 o'clock, but one of the notations we got at the 2019 symposium, which was in person, that at this point, everyone just went home or went back to work or went somewhere. And we didn't get the opportunity to really just kind of stay together and talk about what we had learned and the people we had interacted with and the speakers who had spoken. So we do have a social um, hour now and outside those doors, um, just a little wine and cheese and enjoy yourselves and your colleagues here today. Um, I also want to make a comment. I asked for Paulette before. Please, Paulette, tell me you're here. There she is. I want to say, you know, we've been celebrating International Women. We've been celebrating Women's History Month. We celebrated our fabulous speakers. We celebrated our award winners. And I want to celebrate Paulette. Without her, this day would not have happened. So thank you, Paulette. All right, so one, two things. Out that door or out that door, we've got a little reception, so please enjoy. And as you're leaving, you can't have an umbrella meeting without an umbrella. So make sure you take your umbrella as you are going home, and I hope that you have only sunny days ahead. <laughs> <laughs>